Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Bees and I'm here to talk to you about the Strain Gauge and Beam Stiffness Lab for ME4031W Basic Mechanical Measurements Lab. In this video, we'll go over the experimental setup featuring the Wheatstone Bridge as well as the calibration and actual measurements. The procedure will go into the calibration and the static and dynamic measurements, and then we'll go into the results that we expect from this experiment. So we'll start out with the experimental setup. Here's the equipment you'll see when you get into the lab. Important clarity note is that the strain indicator box here is a single box and this is just the lid for the box. And here is a schematic of that setup. So here we have a cantilever beam with an active strain gauge attached to the region where there will be deformation and then a compensating gauge located on the same material but will not be experiencing mechanical strain. These are connected to the strain indicator box plugged into the P negative, S negative, and P positive ports. And the strain indicator box has internal resistances that completes a Wheatstone bridge as you can see in this schematic over here. The decade resistance box is plugged in only during the calibration phase and acts as the shunt resistance which runs in parallel to the active gauge. The strain indicator box can also output a voltage signal corresponding to the strain being measured to the oscilloscope and a balance is used in order to measure the weight of the washers that will provide the load that deforms the cantilever beam. Now for the sake of the experiment the material of the cantilever beam is not known to you and your objective is to determine that material based upon your experimentation. The active gauge measures the strain caused by deflection of both gravity and the load attached to the end of the beam. The compensating gauge measures the resistance change caused by the temperature variations that both strain gauges experience. While the thickness gauge is not being used, the thickness gauge knob will allow you to raise and lower this beam until the beam is perfectly horizontal, which is important for the calibration process. As mentioned before, the strain indicator box includes internal resistances as well as a voltage supply, which allows the strain indicator box to simulate a Wheatstone bridge when connected to the active and compensating gauge. Here we have the equation for the Wheatstone bridge with the output voltage and input voltage, the resistances of the strain gauges, which are commonly set equal to one another, resulting in this fraction equaling one quarter. The active gauge generates a positive change in resistance, therefore increasing the output voltage. The compensating gauge has a subtractive feature. The compensating gauge subtracts out changes in resistance and since both the active and compensating gauge experience the same resistance change due to temperature variation, this can remove the strain that the active gauge experiences due to this temperature variation, leaving only the mechanical strain. Meanwhile, the internal resistances do not vary, and therefore these two terms drop out to zero. Now the strain indicator box requires some input information, and that is the gauge factor, which you can find marked on the beam right here. It will also require balancing under a zero strain condition which can be achieved by making sure that this beam is completely horizontal using the thickness gauge knob. Wheatstone bridges are typically identified based upon how many active strain gauges are present within the system which is labeled with an addition of one quarter for each active gauge. This can be understood based upon this equation where this is a one quarter factor and then for each gauge that produces a positive change in resistance acts as a multiplier to this one quarter. In order to make sure that each of these is positive, you would just need all the positive terms within this equation to be under tension, while the negative terms be under compression. In application, this involves placing the gauges on one side or the other of a beam. Based upon this identification method, this system should only be a one quarter strain gauge because the compensating gauge does not contribute to the mechanical strain reading. However, the strain indicator box does not have an option for indicating which gauges are active or passive, and therefore you should use the 
half bridge configuration since there will be two strain gauges attached to the strain indicator box. The last thing to note about the strain indicator box is that you want to disable all but channel 1 in order to get the proper channel to read on the display. During your calibration process you will want to use a decade resistance box which acts as a shunt resistance and you can vary this resistance by turning each of these knobs representing a 10 times multiplier, 100 times multiplier, and so on as you move to the left. An important note about the decade resistance box is that if the resistance value that you choose is a small value approaching zero, then the strain indicator will not be able to read the resistance and provide invalid readings. During the measurement process, you will be placing a load on the end of your cantilever beam, and that load will be made up of washers of various sizes, as you can see over here. And these washers will be fixed to the beam by a screw and nut, and you'll want to include the screw and nut in your mass measurement. Before operating the balance, you'll want to make sure that the balance is level, which you can accomplish by twisting the feet on each of the four corners of the balance and watch as the bubble level goes towards the center. Then you'll want to press the tear button which zeroes your mass measurement. The objective of the oscilloscope is to measure the frequency of the oscillation of the cantilever beam when deflected by a small amount. So in order to output the information from the strain indicator box to the oscilloscope, You'll want to make sure that the analog output of the strain indicator box has options set to excitation on, analog out as channel 1, the rejection should be 60 Hz, and your output range should be low. In order to measure the frequency on the oscilloscope, you'll want to press on the measure button, which will open up a menu on the right, in which case you can press the button that lines up with time and then turn the position dial until you get down to frequency and then you can press on that dial in order to select it. Typically you would want to use the auto button in order to find the signal that you're trying to measure. If the auto scale option does not help you locate the signal then you'll want to use the scale in both the vertical and horizontal direction as well as the trigger in order to locate that signal. Now since this signal is a damped oscillator, the frequency will diminish with time, and so you'll want to make sure that your measurement includes the excitation of the beam, which means that you'll want to take the measurement immediately after deflecting the beam. Now we'll move on to the procedure. In order to perform the calibration, you'll want to first connect the strain gauges to the strain indicator box in the half bridge configuration, which can be found on the cover of the strain indicator box. Then you'll want to enter the gauge factor given on the cantilever beam setup. You can balance the bridge by first making sure that the beam is perfectly horizontal and then pressing the balance button. Then you'll want to connect the decade resistance box in parallel with the active strain gauge. Then you'll want to adjust the decade box's resistances until you achieve the micro strain readings given in the lab manual. Remember that shunt resistance values that are too low will not allow a strain reading to be produced. Before you move on to the experimental measurements, you'll want to construct the calibration plot using the simulated strain with respect to the shunt resistance and the strain gauge resistance in order to determine the gauge factor, as well as the correction factor to the gauge factor given on the cantilever beam, which is just a ratio between the given and experimental gauge factor. Note that R1 corresponds to the nominal strain gauge resistance, which can be found in the data analysis section of the lab manual. There are two strain gauges reported in the data analysis section, so make sure the resistance corresponds to the gauge factor that you found on the cantilever beam setup. For the static measurements, you'll want to measure out five to eight different weight combinations of washers between zero and 50 grams, and make sure to include the screw and nut in your weight calculation. Then you'll want to add those washer combinations to the beam using the screw and nut, and then record the strain measured by the strain indicator box. Then for the dynamic measurement, you'll connect the strain indicator box to the oscilloscope, and then using the previously determined weight combinations, 
you will deflect the beam by less than one centimeter and allow the beam to oscillate freely. Be careful not to deflect the beam too much as it can damage the strain gauge. Then you'll want to record the frequency of each load. Before you leave, you'll want to make sure to measure all relevant dimensions, which includes the total length of the beam, the distance between the active gauge and the end of the beam, the thickness of the beam, as well as the width of the beam. Now we'll move on to results. From this experiment, you'll want to produce four things. First is the calibration plot, which should be a linear relationship between strain and resistance which will allow you to determine the gauge factor through linear regression. Based upon equation 20, you can use linear regression in order to determine the gauge factor. Then you'll want to make a plot of the weight applied to the beam versus the strain indicated by the strain indicator box. And again, you will use linear regression to determine the beam stiffness based upon equation 13. Then for the dynamic measurement, you'll want to produce a mass versus frequency plot which through linear regression you can determine not only the beam stiffness, but also the equivalent mass of the beam. Note that this equivalent mass is not the same as the actual mass of the beam, and you will need to do further calculations in order to determine the true mass of the beam. Finally, you'll want to create a summary table including the beam stiffness, mass, and the elastic modulus. Note that the mass will only be determined using the dynamic measurement, while the beam stiffness and elastic modulus can be determined from both the static and dynamic measurements. All three of these values should be compared to expectation, which is your predicted material properties. The elastic modulus can be calculated based upon the equation provided in the appendix, equation B15, where I corresponds to the moment of inertia of a cantilever beam. That's all I have for you, so I hope that you have found this helpful and that you have a wonderful day.